I'm Melissa Lansman. I'm the member of parliament for Thornhill. That's the proudest thing about it. And then I'm also deputy leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. And I bring greetings and, uh, and best wishes from Pierre Polyev, who's, uh, who's, who's out on, uh, in a different town today. But uh, we're covering our bases. And I want to take a, a, a moment to tell you a little bit about who I am, what I believe, and why I spend every single day fighting like so many of you here, and it's nice to be amongst so many friends. It doesn't start in this country, and it doesn't even start with me. It starts with my parents 50 years ago in the former Soviet Union. They were born in that country. They lived a third of their lives there, and they saw firsthand the oppression, the fear, the lack of opportunity that defined the USSR. In 1973, they decided to leave there, seek a better life in another place, and that place was Canada. After 40 years of living behind the Iron Curtain, this country is where they voted for the first time, is where they voted for the first time in a free and democratic election. This is the country where they were able, for the first time, to feel safe in their community. And this is the country where they were free for the first time to speak their minds, worship who they chose, and make their own decisions about how to raise their children. And despite not speaking English as a first language, despite being from an ethnic and religious minority, and despite having to drive a taxi instead of being an engineer like he was in his home country, my father never complained about his new life in Canada. And despite having two kids to take care of, holding a job during the day, getting a degree by night, my mom remained extremely grateful to have come to this nation. Because even though they didn't have much of anything, my parents had one thing and they had themselves. And in a country like Canada, that was enough. Canada was the land of opportunity and they knew that by working hard, by playing by the rules, by dreaming big, they could build lives for their children that would be better than the ones that they left behind. That was the deal. It was how it was for generations. That was the promise of the rich history and the freedom of individual rights, the rule of law, the things that we enjoy in Canada. Canada was a place where my parents bought their first home, in a community where I grew up, just north of the Toronto city border. And for my parents owning their own home, owning their own property, a right so basic was so completely foreign to them, and it epitomized the promise of this country. To them, a home was a, the complete opposite of everything they had left behind. It represented liberty, it represented safety and security and the sanctity of family. It represented the opportunity for growth and prosperity, one that their future held. And I want to talk a little bit more about housing, not because it's at the core of what many of you do as municipalities, certainly what we do as governments, but also because it is the core of what it means to be Canadian and what our country offers to so many people who came here. First, I want to, um, you can clap. I want to thank you, though, today for, for representing your home communities. I know many of you, I don't know many others, and I know that the work of local mayors, of councillors, of reeves, of wardens, of commissioners, and everybody else in your orbit is often work that's hard, that's thankless, and let's face it, done for free. You have my complete respect and admiration. You have my support for you wanting things to change and for actually doing something about it. And I want to thank FCM for providing the forum to be able to do that better and for having me here today. But back to my parents. For them, owning their own home allowed them to do many other things. For my dad, it was going for tax, from taxi driver to small business owner to medium business owner to a successful man that was no longer held back by the lack of recognition for his credentials or his broken English. And for my mom, it was getting a degree in accounting, going to work as a married woman in the 80s, and climbing the corporate ladder while figuring out how to raise two kids that turned out half okay. My story and my family's story could only take place in Canada. 
where someone with my last name can go from the front seat of a taxi to the front row of parliament in one generation, and we must never forget that. And my story's not unique. It might be your story too, and if you've lived it, you know about the deal that I spoke about. And here's how it goes. You work hard, you follow the law, you get a good house in a safe neighborhood, and you get ahead, and you leave a future for the next generation that was better than yours. That's the deal. But that deal is broken. My parents bought their first house north of Toronto, just less than an hour from here. It used to be 30 minutes from now. Now it's sometimes an hour and 15 minutes. But they bought it for $130,000 in 1980. And there was certainly times where it was tough to make ends meet. And with an 18% uh, interest rate on a mortgage on the horizon, a taxi driver could afford to buy a home in a safe neighborhood and raise kids. A house in that very same neighborhood, just down the street from where I grew up, just sold for $1.6 million. In eight short years, the cost to buy a house has doubled, the average mortgage payment has doubled, and you, can't, you, you can barely rent because that cost has doubled too. You don't have to go to Thornhill to see that. The average income to buy the average home in Toronto or frankly in most places in the GTA now, not a mansion, not an estate, but an average home. The average income you need is $207,000 a year, and you and I both know that there's not a lot of people that make that kind of money every year. It's not just a big city phenomenon, because the standard home price in Canada is double what it was in the US, despite, that they, despite the fact that they have a population 10 times bigger than ours and live on a landmass land that is smaller than ours. And it's not just the US. We are the biggest country by area in the G7 and we have the fewest homes per capita. We have more land where no one lives than land where anybody lives. We told our young people, immigrants, nearly everybody else that if they worked hard, if they did everything that they were supposed to do, if they went to school, if they got a job, then they would be able to afford a home. And of course, that they would be better off than their parents and their grandparents because that was the way it was. It's the way that it had always been. That one day they could be able to raise their own children in the place that they grew up, and that's becoming impossible in this country. But no matter what they do, the dream of a place to live, a place to call their own, is slipping away. Nine out of ten young people in this country do not believe that they will ever own a home. And that's not me saying that, that's what they're saying to the pollsters. And as the goalposts move farther and farther away, the dream seems harder and harder to attain. They're losing hope for the future. And when people can't afford a place to live, they can't afford to do anything else in this country. And I'm sure that you see that every day in your communities. I certainly see that. They can't get, go to school and get good grades. I've heard heartbreaking stories of students living in homeless shelters just so they can afford university tuition. They can't afford to feed themselves good nutritious food. One in five Canadians are cutting back or going without just so they can make ends meet. 1.5 million Canadians ate in a food bank in this country in a single month. And people ask for medical assistance in dying not because they're sick, but because they're hungry. That's the situation in Canada. And they can't afford to do other things like the luxury of travel. For instance, 48% of people are cutting back on vacations as they face higher rents and higher mortgage payments. The Prime Minister has run up more debt than all of his predecessors combined. He grew the public service by 31%, and he has still achieved the results of record inflation, the highest interest rates in a generation, and out-of-control crime in some of our neighborhoods. We've spent nearly $90 billion as a country on a national housing strategy for rents and for home prices and for mortgages to double. Only for us to lose 20,000 units of affordable housing over eight years. 
and for us to build 50 thousand less houses this year than we did last year and last year wasn't a particularly good year on that front we don't have a national housing strategy we have a national housing crisis and it's about time somebody in Ottawa said so in my home here in the GTA we need to build 300,000 homes a year and that's a conservative estimate and we're on track to build 125,000. So the problems that we are facing with supply, with price, with density are only going to keep getting worse and it's fundamentally clear that something has to change because we can't keep going down this path. That's crazy. It's easy to feel hopeless, there, and there's a lot of people who do, and it's easy to feel like things are happening, the things that are happening are outside of your control, and I can understand why, as someone who speaks to so many Canadians every single day who can't get ahead, that you would think that. You do too. I know that. I have a great relationship with our city councillors, and they hear the same thing. And I'm sure you can understand these things feel like they're out of control, but the truth is, is many of them are within our control. And my mission and the mission of the entire Conservative Party is to turn that hurt into hope, to transform our nation into a place where hard work once again pays off, and where people like my parents and so many who share that story can leave a better future for their children. That's why we serve, that's why we ask the tough questions. And looking around, this room today around this conference, you start to feel a sense of hope again because I know that I'm surrounded by some of the best leaders in Canada who, knew, who know their communities the best. They're dedicated to their communities and they know that we can be doing better. Leaders who will help get us back on the road to prosperity and help clean up the mess that we are in, which is not outside of our control. You deserve a government that recognizes that this is indeed a crisis a government that recognizes that the current approach is not good enough, and a government with a bold plan that will take decisive action to bring home safe streets and affordable homes. And so do Canadians. We recognize the need to build more homes and get more done. And we need to put shovels in the ground and cranes in the sky and not to make fancy announcements without follow through. Right now we see a lot of photo ops, we see really well written press releases, we see some pretty nice promises, but we actually don't see results. And nobody is held accountable. And, that's what, and it matters, because you know that you can't live in an empty lot, and you can't live in a building that's not built, and you certainly can't live in a housing accelerator. And that's the, that's the central promise of, I think, what is a broken plan. Where can you live? It's a home, a residence, an apartment. And that can only happen if we get them built. We will use the power of the federal government to help get that done by rewarding cities who get things done faster, who cut red tape, and who actually increase supply. And of course, I know it's not as simple as that. And there are infrastructure needs, the stuff below and the stuff around, but it's a start. I like to compare the current situation, and you'll all remember this, about a, like a, it's like a group project in school. Somebody does a lot of work, there's a few people who do what's needed. There's some people who do nothing at all, and you all get the same result. In school, it's a grade, and in Canada, it's infrastructure funding. It's the same thing. We're doing the crazy thing over and over again. Canada's conservatives think that the amount that you get should be tied to the amount that you do, and there are so many out here doing so much leading to fairness in municipalities who actually do the work, and there is no shortage of them. Let's talk about fairness. Let's talk about what it actually means to access supports. There are countless stories of private sector builders, charitable groups, municipalities who have simply given up on accessing CMHC programs because of the difficulties and the red tape associated with them. And there's, there's a lot of shaking heads, yes. And for example, I'll, I'll give you this, the, the Covenant House in Vancouver completed a multi-million dollar expansion. They applied for CMHC funding and they were approved for $12 million. But that wasn't before spending a million dollars on consultants and reports that it took to get that funding. For less populated communities and small and independent groups, these resources are impossible to attain. 
or the bureaucracy is impossible to navigate. Many just give up, resulting in a whole lot of lost opportunities. Our team will get the federal government out of the way and remove the red tape, allowing municipalities, all municipalities, to get the money that they deserve and to build the housing that we all need. And finally, our government's going to sell off 15% of the underutilized federal buildings and properties, which could be transformed into affordable housing, and we're going to make sure that that happens. The structures sit empty. You pay for them anyways. I think they should be put to good use and made into good homes for people that need them most. And we'll take stock of the available federal lands and we'll make sense of that too, where we can build more housing. It shouldn't just be the provinces and the municipalities who actually build places to live. The federal government can pitch in too. And I'll give you an example in, in Winnipeg. There are two buildings adjacent to each other. They're each owned by the federal government, both of which are 50% occupied. I think we solved the riddle here. Like, we can combine those offices, we can free up a tower. It's not that difficult. It just takes some political will. And that's just the beginning of our plan. And rest assured, you're going to be hearing a lot more from us on housing and on many other issues that you're discussing here. And I look forward to speaking to many of you individually and get your feedback and ideas that will help shape our platform for the help that we all know we need and the help that is coming. And the job doesn't start when you're in opposition, and it starts now by being a credible alternative with a plan to the government that we have now and calling them out on their failures, their incompetence, and their ineptitude. And by providing hope to the millions of Canadians who are hurting right now. We're working and we will continue to work for you and every day and everybody who wants to work hard and get ahead and live the Canadian dream. It was true for my parents. It's going to be true for the next generation. It's going to be true for the generation after that because that's how it's always been. We'll build a nation where it doesn't matter where you come from. It matters where you're going. It doesn't matter who you are, but what you can do. It doesn't matter if your name is Martin or Mohammed or Singh or Smith or Deng or Dubois. It doesn't matter what color your skin is what language you speak, what your family looks like, if you pray on Friday, on Saturday, on Sunday, or not at all. Some people tell you that it is not possible and that we can't do it and that it's out of our hands and that no one can fix it. But I know that it's possible because we lived it, because of the work that you do every single day. The government says that we should be happy with what we have and that you've never had it so good that record inflation, that record home prices, and broken basic services are the best we can do. And conservatives say that we can do better on housing, on taxes, on the environment, on ethics, and just about on every other issue in Canada. And we will bring it home for hardworking Canadians, make hard work pay off again, and be the true voice of common sense for the common people that has been lost in Ottawa. You have my complete admiration for the work that you do day in and day out. And I want to thank you for your service and thank you for being here. And best of luck with this wonderful conference. Look forward to chatting.